Mercury Act 2, what a powerful record, right? Well, and they are here with us. Please give a warm welcome to Imagine Dragons. Thank you. I recognize people from the show. Yeah, there are a lot of them here. I talked to them, yes, yes. Thank you so much for being here. Just mentioned you had a big show last night in Vienna, and now you're here with us to talk about this amazing, powerful record that we just listened to. Um, I have trouble like talking right now because I need to digest. It's, I'm so emotional. It's so heavy. But um, nice to have you here uh, again in Vienna. How are you guys doing? Oh, uh, well, wow, that was such a wonderful, beautiful welcome. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. This has always been one of our favorite cities. Um, I, t I was telling someone earlier, but uh, when I went home from our very first international tour back to the States, I sat down with my mom and dad, very shell-shocked uh, as a... I guess I was 23, 24 at the time. And they asked me uh, what were my favorite places to see in the world. And uh, my favorite city was Vienna. And uh, Thank so you. It's, it's a really cool, Thank you so and this is a true story, true story. <laughs> so it's very full circle to you know be putting out this record, uh, to be here with these, these wonderful people. And last night's show here was just such a, war there was such a wonderful warm energy and so yeah, we're just really happy to be here. I, I can't believe you guys just heard the record. That's such a crazy thing for us. We've been working on this for many years. So it's a strange thing when you've worked really hard on something and then and then you kind of just release it to the world. It feels uh, a little in intimidating, but also it's a it's a good feeling. Yeah. Great. We should also say hello and welcome everyone online from from all over the world. Yes, <laughs> we're joining us on the live stream. So yeah, let's talk about um, the record. It's really hard to kick off that Q&A because as I said, I, I got really emotional back there. Um, uh, but you know, you've always been very emotional and heavy in like your songs, but I feel like this time you're maybe more transparent, more literal in your lyrics. Uh, was that um, a conscious decision to maybe be less metaphorical or is that something that happened maybe naturally during the pandemic? You know, I think it's two things. Uh, one, I mean, first of all, the guys have always made me feel comfortable um, to say what I feel. And when I was young, I didn't feel that way. Um, I felt, you know, I started songwriting when I was 12. And lyrically, I was very, very overly metaphorical because the only people who were listening to my music at that time was my parents, really. And, you know, as a teenager, you don't always want your parents to know <laughs> your most vulnerable thoughts. <laughs> so I would really hide it. Um, and then that went on into the beginning of this, uh, of our careers. And when I sat down, and, and the guys were always cool about it, nobody ever questioned or, or, you know, they always made me feel comfortable to speak my truth, but I just still had a hard time saying it in a way that I knew maybe someone could figure it out, because mm -hmm. that's vulnerable, right? But uh, really with Rick Rubin on this record, he really helped me, I think. He sat down and went over every song and he would say, well, why did you say that? And when you have someone questioning you like that, and it's Rick Rubin who's like a legend and so, such, done so many incredible things and I respect him so much, it, he allowed me, he, he never made me feel uncomfortable, but he allowed me to feel vulnerable enough to, to change things here and there, to maybe be a little more direct 
which a lot of my favorite singer songwriters like Paul Simon, Bob Dylan, Cat Stevens, especially Cat Stevens was like, you, you know what he's saying, right? On Father and Son, like you know what he's saying. Give it up for Cat Stevens. Yes. Yeah. 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 So yes, yeah. Absolutely. Another song that we just heard uh, is called Younger, and in that song you're fantasizing about like uh, being a kid again, having no responsibilities, as we do every once in a while, right? So I was wondering, what kind of kids were you? Like, who was the shy one? Who was the class clown? Um, were you into music this whole like um, during your childhood? Uh, yeah, I actually, when I was eight years old, uh, my teacher gave us the assignment to write a letter to yourself, the adult version of yourself, about how you picture your life being, what you're going to grow up to be, and all that. And I wrote a letter. Uh, she, she then took these letters. That I'm from a very small town, so she kept them together. And at my high school graduation, she gave them back to me and all my classmates. And uh, if like I, I read the letter, and it said that I... Um, was going to be a professional musician traveling wow. the world. Wow. I've been very singular minded. Wow. That's um, <laughs> so I'd say that I was kind of, you know, like this but smaller. <laughs> less tattoos, probably, as well. Yeah, a few, a few less. Yeah, that, I, this didn't happen until I was like nine, ten. <laughs> yeah. Right. What about you, Wayne? Uh, yeah, I was a very shy mm. kid, which, you know, has still haunts me uh, to this day a little bit. This is way more nerve-wracking than playing on stage, having to speak and talk to all of you. But I feel very comforted knowing that you guys are fans. And um, I honestly, like, I just want to ask you guys the questions. You know, like Dan said, we've been locked away for so, you know, we've been locked away during the pandemic and, and uh, making the record. We just, you know, you never know how things are going to be received. You, you don't really know until you ask people who care about what you do. So you know, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk to you guys about what you thought of the record. But anyway, yeah, I was very shy, and uh, I was actually also, uh, somehow, I was into music a lot, and I was also voted most likely to be a rock star. Wow. But there was only four people in my class, so the odds were in my favor. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think... It's probably this, I mean, I can't speak for Platzman until he speaks for himself, but I will just say we all, you know, I, music was everything to me from a very young age. I grew up in a family of a lot of music. My older brothers always had garage bands, and I'd peek downstairs in the basement, and they'd be practicing, and I just had always wished that I could play with them, you know, because it was so, it was like magic, right? Like everything else, I hated middle school, and I remember specifically in middle school, watching them perform and just seeing how much joy it would bring to them. And so when my brother would go away to a friend's house, I would sneak into his room, and he's actually our manager now, so he's here tonight. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yep. But I, I would sneak into his room and I would take his microphone and, um, and get on the family computer and bring up this program at the time that was called Cakewalk, which was back in the day kind of the Ableton or Logic, or it was the da of the time. And I, I just kind of taught myself, okay, this is the record button, here's the stop button if I do this. And, and then I would sing and stack my voice on top of it itself and do all the instruments just vocally. Um, and it, it was just magic to me to have nothing there and feel like I could be vulnerable and speak everything I wanted to say that I never felt that I could say to a human. You know, if someone was sitting across from me, I wouldn't be saying these things, I wouldn't be singing these things, but I was by myself and I felt safe to do it. And so that was, that was it for me at that age. It was just like, everything else was just noise, you know, like sports and all those things. It was like, this is cool, but I'd rather be writing a song, you know? And, uh, and that's all I've ever known. And so yeah, applause. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, uh, I'd say you called it correctly. Uh, I was definitely a very musically minded child. Um, chamber music actually was a family hobby going back a few generations. So when I told my dad I wanted to play the violin when I was a kid, I didn't realize the uh, huge trap I had just stepped in <laughs> and like that I had to now practice violin every day. And um, But, uh, you know, sight reading music and getting to know classical music, uh, I'm so grateful for that because I don't think I would have been as into uh, jazz or prog rock or any of the you know, crazy music that I ended up getting into if I didn't have that foundation from a young age. And uh, 
I, I was somewhere between a class clown and <laughs> not shy, but I was on my school's ultimate Frisbee varsity team. So wow. I was something of a jock. <laughs> yeah. Oh, materialized your dreams. I love that. That's very inspiring to hear that. Um, you're also one of the most successful bands on the planet, period. That's a fact. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. And I don't think you reach that level of success without being ambitious, without being driven, maybe even a perfectionist. But in the song Blur, which I thought was very interesting, you also talk about um, the negative sides of these attributes, you know? never having enough, never being satisfied. How do you as a band kind of balance, you know, between um, ambition and focus and then also just being chill and being satisfied with whatever you're doing? <laughs> I, th I think it's a, a hard lesson to learn because as a young band, you, ambition's everything and you're just trying to see how far you can go. But then as you get older, you start realizing kind of there, the balance is important too, and that being happy is also a thing to prioritize. Um, and uh, you know, in the early stages, your happiness is just directly correlated with your success and, and how hard you're working. But I think, you know, I can't speak for the guys with families here, but I think that had to be a life-changing event that kind of changed, changed priorities a little bit. And I, can, I can't speak for myself and say that, you know, spending time with my cat at home nice. certainly is more valuable than it used to be. Cat person, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, you know, we, we have kind of an ongoing joke that was a routine thing. Wayne's already knowing exactly what I'm going to say. But <laughs> for many years, in the early stages, we did have this deep hunger for, you know, it was like when you're a musician and your whole life you've worked for something, you know, since you were, you know, for us it was... You know, I started piano lessons at six. I think all of us started music at, really as toddlers, like that young, young age. It was all we did and we practiced and the guys went to school for it. They all went to Berkeley and Boston and, and so we've dedicated our life to it. So once something comes along and you've been a, and also we were broke musicians together. When the band started, there were three years where we were living together and we were broke and, and money was like, it wasn't there. And when you're there as a musician and then you've dedicated your whole life to it, when opportunities come, you're very hungry. You're like a ravenous wolf. You're like, travel across the world to play a show to 150 people, yes. Play at the mall in front of five people, yes. Open for a mime, okay, fine. <laughs> what, like, you know what I mean? Like, all real things that we said yes to because you, you, you know that it's like, it's the greatest honor and blessing to be able to do this, that everybody wants to do this, right? Like actors who are A-list actors are like, <laughs> right, but I want to be a musician. Like yeah. everybody wants to, to do this. So that being said, I would always turn to Wayne <laughs> and we would always say, uh, when we would achieve a goal, like for instance, it was like selling out a room of 100 people. And then we turn to each other and say, well, next time, if the room is 200 people, then we'll be happy. <laughs> and then it was, you know, if we can do a tour, then we'll be happy. And then, it, you know, there was always this next thing. And it's a dangerous game to play. And we let go of it many years ago because you realize it, that's not happiness, right? Like, but as a starving musician, you see that and you want, you want to achieve. You want, you want to, you know, the little kid in you wants to see the world and be on a, play in, on a stadium level, like, but I think you get to a point where you realize that being at home with your cat is equally as rewarding <laughs> as it is. It really is. It's equally rewarding in a lot of ways. So, you, you know, we let go of that. And I think now we're more focused on, did we make a record that's honest? Mm -hmm. That's number one. Is it honest? Did we enjoy it? Did we enjoy being on stage? Absolutely. You're also very prolific musicians. Is it true that you wrote 250 songs for this record and then you send them to Rick Rubin and then he got back to you with notes on 70 songs? Is that also how you chose like which songs um, you're gonna include on the record? And how did you choose though which one are gonna go on act one and which one on act two? Yeah, uh, yeah uh, yes it is true and it's been the same for every record. And you know, I will say that I, I uh, I should clarify something. I genuinely, like, and I, all of us, I can speak for all of us when I say this, because we all do the same thing. 
we aren't writing 300 songs because you know you need to write 300 songs to make a good record or something. It if we weren't in this band, mm -hmm. I would be writing 300 songs. I've done it since I was young. So if you do the math, there's like th there really are thousands of songs that I have at this point. I do it because it's my journal entry. Mm -hmm. It's the exact same. It, it sometimes it takes me as long as it takes someone to sit down and write a journal for me to make a song because I've worked with these DAWs for so long that with Ableton, which is my DAW of choice, I can almost record as fast as I can think it. You know, with the hot shortcuts, hot keys, the way that we are today, and there's pros and cons, right, to like recording on vinyl and things like that. But for me, I like to take all the tools that make it so the, as quick as I think it, it's there. If I hear that in my head, it's there. Like. And so I've done that for so long, and, and, and as well as the guys, that we, it's just, it comes so naturally. It's almost easier than speaking your feelings. So we write, you know, 250, 300 songs every record just because, because we love it, because we enjoy it. And most of those songs never get heard, and that's okay. Uh, and a lot of them are terrible and probably should never be heard. <laughs> but, but we love it, and that's why we do it. It's not a process of like, if we do this many, then it'll be good, or you know, because some people write ten songs for a record, and it's yeah. fantastic, right? Every artist is different. That's the beauty of creating. Go ahead. I was just gonna say, uh, when Rick Rubin gave us notes on over a hundred songs, <laughs> I got so excited to make this record, mm -hmm. and it like suddenly became real to me in the process that we were gonna make this album with Rick Rubin. Uh, at his at his studio and and for him to go through I mean he's such a legend for him to go through that many songs and and they weren't like lazy notes they were like really thoughtful poignant notes uh, it it was just it was it was the first of many amazing Rick Rubin experiences along making this record <laughs> and it wasn't a hundred because he said a hundred is my limit <laughs> you know it was like send me as many as you will and we were like okay we're only gonna send you a little we'll send you a hundred <laughs> so yeah he. He, he took the time. He really did. It's funny because it's every time I talk to somebody who's not super familiar with Rick Rubin, mm -hmm. but has seen photos or heard of the legend of Rick Rubin, everybody envisions kind of this man on a couch yeah. that's like stro stroking his beard, <laughs> maybe says two words, right? Like walks in the room and is like, change this. Right. And then walk, like yeah. Wizard of Oz. Exactly. He's really not. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's, he is kind of the Wizard of Oz in that he's like so wise, right? But um, maybe I'm thinking of Gandalf as a better. I don't know if the Wizard he's of Oz. He's wise, too. Yeah, I guess so. But he's more of like, right? He was like, uh, he would trick people, right? The Wizard of Oz is like behind the scenes, like, da, 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 da. Wizard of Oz is a known trickster. Yeah, yeah, He's not a trickster, I guess. He's a con artist. Yeah, yeah. But no, he, would, he was there, like, at the beginning of the day, last to leave, like, very dedicated to the craft, very involved. Amazing. You're also a very visual band. We just watched two of your videos. Very cinematic. You've always been like that. Um, I want to also talk about the cover art because it's so beautiful. Like on Act One, we see this man falling down, which kind of reminded me a little bit of the Mad Men opening uh, titles. I don't know if you've seen um, the show. Um, and then Act Two, we see the same man, but he's kind of jumping or rising, or maybe he's falling down, but this time with confidence and strength. You know, um, what can you tell us about the cover art? We really had a theme going from the very beginning of this band where we would listen to the record and we would try to, to decide visually what it looked like to us. And that's a hard thing to know. And the guys have really helped me with that because I feel like I have a really hard time even knowing what I'm saying. And often, you know, I'll, I'll write these songs and not even really know what I'm talking about until years later. But I feel like when we get together, the guys are able to really see the themes and, and that's why a band unit is so special, I think. And there's not a lot of bands, really, at, at this time in, in, in uh, music. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a shame in a lot of ways because there's something really special of, about people who are spell-checking each other mm -hmm. and also just a, a brothers that can tell each other things on a deep level. Like it, There is a familialness to being in a band, um, that it becomes more and more evident. Like, for instance, a small note that I don't know if many of fans know and maybe they would want to know. So our show, as you watch it, there's poetry through the whole thing um, that was written by Wayne. He hand wrote all the... You know, <clears throat> hey, 
And every night when we play the show, and, and we got this incredible uh, voice actor who, who does all the, um, I wish I could remember his name right now because he deserves to be recognized. But um, so Wayne had written all this poetry that tells the story in such a deep way, it makes me almost emotional every night because it's, uh, we just know each other very well. So as far as the, the man goes, if you look at our first record, it's a little boy who's standing on these elevated um, night visions. He's standing on these elevated stones and it's kind of a scary world. And uh, that's kind of what it felt like at that time. And that record changed our lives forever in great ways and some weird ways, some hard ways, like just like everything in life, right? There's things that come along with everything. But uh, so that boy kind of grows up throughout the these five records, and that is what is portrayed now is this man who is who falls and, and rises and is telling the story of life uh, through through the eyes of this boy. That's amazing. I love that. <laughs> I didn't know that. That's amazing. Um, yeah, we just watched the video, oh, two videos of Bones and Sharks, and um, Sharks has such, you know, Ocean's Eleven and Mission Impossible vibes and stuff like that. It's um, a heist uh, video set in Vegas, of course. You also reminded me a lot of James Bond, I have to say. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, so how fun was it to work on this video, and how did you come up with the concept? It was definitely a lot of fun working yeah. on this video. Um, for for my scene, we got to shoot in in the Bellagio at an actual uh, like table and throw real casino chips into the air. And after <laughs> each cut, they had to like have ten people crawl on the ground and collect. It was like thousands of dollars in chips every shot. And I was like, I can't believe we're actually doing this. This is incredible. Um, just as one of one of many fun stories on that shoot. I also realized that uh, for whatever reason, you guys really like to put me behind a counter. <laughs> Zero music video uh, next to me. Thank you. And now this is in a, that's at least three. It's like the hair. What are you this, trying to tell me? Like, There's something. About I'm just glad you. I didn't have to get slapped beard. this time. What's my hair have to do with it? You just you look like you would provide excellent service. <laughs> Fair enough. And you do. We should also talk about the production mention, um, the production, because it's so amazing, and you've always been a band that's like a uh, genre-bending uh, band, you know? Um, and what I loved about Sharks, it's such a cool pop song, and you had so much fun with the production, because I think, like, there's a point where you mentioned bubbles, and I feel like I can hear a bubble. Yeah, that's me going, <laughs> yeah, That's amazing. Yeah, well, what can you tell us about the production? Yeah, well, you know, we're really, inf we're a, this is another thing about being in a band, right? You're four individuals who grew up listening to four very different types of music. Um, everything from like old country and folk with Ben and Platts and I listened to a lot of hip hop, but he was on the East Coast and I was on the West Coast. Mm. And so that brought different mm. things to the table. Wayne grew up listening to a lot of classic rock as well as 90s grunge and and I listened to a lot of 90s grunge and I mean, and jazz obviously was a big influence. Like there's, I'm leaving off so many things that are like, we, there's a lot. We all love John Williams also. Yes, that's true, <laughs> that is true. Yeah, a lot of film scores though too. So yeah, I think one thing that we all agree on though is we like to make unapologetic pop, big pop music, but we also play our instruments and we play live and there's songs that are, rock and heavy but there's we don't always want to do that that's boring if we did that every song i think we we would be bored so we we're just trying at the end of the day like genres to me are i just they've never really made sense i feel like my favorite band one of my favorite bands growing up was the beatles and the beatles did a lot of very different things like if you're listening to their first record second it's like they they tried a lot of different things and they went a lot of different places and a lot of the hip hop I grew up on, like whether it was like Tupac or Biggie, like Outkast, there was so much experimentation and trying different things. And sometimes you fail, and sometimes you you win. And that's that's the beauty of it. Like I think we're trying to we're trying to make music that we want to listen to, and that's not always a pop song. It's not always a rock song. It's not always always something that's you know influenced by hip hop. It's so. Yeah, genre is, I, our genre is Imagine Dragons. Mm -hmm. That's the genre of, and, and Queen, Queen, Queen's one of my favorite bands to do this as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, genre, yeah, we, we, we try to just create 
music that we enjoy, and that's that's it. Absolutely. Another song that I want to mention is Symphony because I really love that one. It's so life affirming and so beautiful, and also just a metaphor of that. Just life is a big symphony. We're all playing our little instruments. Sometimes we get a solo if we're lucky, but it's all about just like playing together and harmonizing. How did you come up with that song? You know, I'll tell you a story on that one with with Rick. Uh, Rick had sat me down. I was afraid to play Rick Rubin that song. Mm. This is the truth. Because uh, I, I, it, there was a cuteness to it that I was, you know, Rick's done so much heavy, cool stuff that, you know, when something's cute, I didn't know if he would see that and laugh at me or see it and say, this is cute and cool. Okay? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. <laughs> but I like a cute song sometimes, right? Like, I like, I like to be like, would you care if I play you the flute? You know? So right? And or do the trombone noise and I did the trumpet noise with my mouth and these things that I... I really did when I was young too. Like I wanted to capture that kind of youthfulness, mm -hmm. like a song that I would have written when I was 16 or something, right? So when I played it for Rick, and I just like again, you have to just picture sitting across from this like Gandalf figure, <laughs> and you're like, he's like, well, let me hear the song. You're like, or he's like, let's go over every lyric, right? And you're like, okay, <laughs> I've never done that with a producer, so it was very intimidating for me. But uh, one thing that he said, so I played it, and he was like, I love this song. This is great. It's great pop writing. This is, yes. you know, a great idea. And he was like, you know, but let's, let's listen to Stayin'. He would always, he would be like, let's listen to this song. And so he, he played Stayin' Alive mm -hmm. by the Bee Gees. And we went over the lyrics, and he said, you know, it's this happy-sounding song, but if you actually look at the lyrics, they're actually quite, there's some melancholy there, and it, and it makes it work. So we revisited the second verse because it was not, you know, he, he wanted, uh, there were some points where he's like, that part makes me feel emotional a little bit in a sad way almost. Like mm -hmm. the bridge, for instance, you know, and so we, we changed some things. Like he would, he'd have me go in the other room and revisit lyrics to, to find a way to, to go down. He was like, that's vulnerable there. Go more there. You know what I mean? Things like that. So there was a lot of that with this record, and Symphony ended up being one of my you know, favorite songs on the record just because yes. it has that joy to it. And, and there's a lot of heavy stuff on the record, mm -hmm. so it kind of breaks up the heaviness. Um, so yeah. Absolutely. Also one of my favorites. Just one last question for me before we give it up to the audience, because they have lots of questions, I know. Um, the last time I met you was in 2016. It was a different world. You played way smaller venues. Um, and the one thing that I remember you told me in that interview was that uh, you have one rule um, as a band, and that's uh, before you go, and you never go on stage when you're angry with each other. In other words, like you try to resolve all issues before you go on stage. Does that still apply to, to you? Is that rule still valid? <laughs> you know, I will, I mean, I, again, I can't speak for all the guys here, but I, I have never felt more close, more connected more uh, like family with the four of these individuals. And for me, it has been work. We have put in work. We ha we've had therapy together as a band. We've, we, you know, we're, we, say, we stand on these stages and we're, I'm a big proponent of therapy. It would be pretty hypocritical if we didn't do that ourselves. And being in a band is a hard, it's hard. And there's a reason most bands break up, especially after a decade together. And I am incredibly proud uh, to be in a band with these these individuals who are just good-hearted, good people. We all have flaws. We all annoy each other. We've been in bu tour buses for over a decade together. Like you're gonna annoy each other. Mm -hmm. But um, but at the end of the day, we've you know every good relationship takes work. I really believe that, and and um, we've put in a lot of work. But we do believe that uh, in, in that mantra of like if we're gonna go on stage, especially with Imagine Dragons, it's like we're not we're not a band that's going out there. Like our theme, our message, what we want to give these people more than anything is joy, mm -hmm. emotion. That might be sadness, it might be melancholy, it might, whatever it is, like real life. Re and if we're not connected with each other and then we try to go out there and just, it would be an act and people can read right through that and then it wouldn't be a good show. So we always try to refocus ourselves before we go on stage, resolve issues, leave it off stage, figure it out. Um, and, and try to put on the best show we can. All right, thank you so much. Okay, any questions from the audience? So many hands. I saw this guy over there for the... Yes, you, exactly. Wait, just wait for the mic one second.
This one with, with, with the funny hair. <laughs> with the big hair. <laughs> I heard this often that my hair is funny, so it's no problem. <laughs> You're used to that, I'm sure. Stunning. First of all, crazy concert yesterday. It was really amazing. Thank you. And now my question, it's kind of more in general question, but um, how difficult is it for you guys to play such a mix of songs like very it's like being on an emotional roller coaster like on the one hand very dark emotional heavy songs and then on the other hand songs full of adrenaline uh, pushing my, pushing oneself to the limits how difficult is it for you to be on such an emotional roller coaster uh, i think about halfway through a tour i start to feel the effects of that a little bit uh, there's definitely Moments during the show where, you know, definitely after um, the second act, uh, when we, before we played Birds, it's always really emotional just because I know that, you know, everyone in this band has experienced loss and, uh, you know, part of what it means to grow older, you know, talking about the song Younger, part, part of growing up is just coping with death and uh, it's a really hard part, you know, I'm just sure so many people here have lost people. So there's moments like that that always get me and then, you know, you got to, you know, then there's the energetic moments like, you know, radioactive where you got to switch gears a little bit. But yeah, I'm starting <laughs> to feel a little bit. But I, l luckily, we're, our, our pacing for this tour has been way more manageable. Like, you know, in the past, we do 200 shows a year. And it's, yeah, it's, for us, it was unsustain uh, unsustainable for sure. But now we have, you know, two days off and we can play a show. It's, it's like we have it made in the shade now. Like we really can't complain about anything. So that's a great question, though. For sure, because it is a real thing. Um, all, and all of us are highly emotional individuals. I think artists are always, you know, you're, you're very sensitive, and that's why you get into art, and it's part of, it comes with the trade. But, um, and uh, we're not actors, right? It's like, at least I could say, like, genuinely, I can't sing a song without my mind just going to where I was when I sang it. It's the beauty of it, but there's also a toll that comes with that, right? Because you're also, you're reliving something that might be a great moment in your life. It also might be maybe a traumatic moment. And, and I, I go there always, always. It's just been part of, the, of my process when I'm on stage. And sometimes you don't want to always go there, right? It was like when I was in a hard separation with my wife, few years back, and we're together now, we've had a child since, so this isn't a sad story. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I would have to go on stage every night, and we just put out this record, and one of the songs was called Walking the Wire, and it was about persevering, and it was about her, and it was about our love persevering, and here we were in shambles, about to get a divorce, and I'm walking on stage, and I had to sing that song. And then we'd sing, like, next to me, and I just, it was just like, so hard to not just like sob on stage every night playing those songs and sometimes I did and the great thing is we have fans around the world that have been so supportive and they know that that's it's an it's an emotional experience it is a roller coaster and, and they're there for that and we, and we are we feel an obligation to give that and it's easy to give because that's all we know how to give as a band is truth and and, and show ourselves and to feel vulnerable and you guys have always allowed us that, and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. Okay. She's next, because she has a little notepad and a pencil, and I love it. She came prepared. <laughs> um, hi, guys. First of all, I was in Rio 2018, and you actually cried after Walking the Wire in the fall. It was really wow. emotional. That day was one of my, the best days of my life. But um, I changed questions when I was listening to the songs because one of the songs kind of like shocked me a little bit. I was not expecting that and it was Waves. It just had this huge plot twist and I was like, my jaw was like, and uh, I just really want to know for you all, especially for you, because I, I kind of know the story behind it, how it was to work on that song knowing that it has such a switch at the end and it's such a, an amazing message. Well, that's it. That, well, thank you. Um, that's, yeah, that's one of my favorite songs on the record. Uh, it's also 
one of the heaviest songs on the record for me to listen to. It's about, um, there's two songs on the record that are about one of my best friends who, who uh, took his own life throughout the last few years. Uh, but we were best friends since middle school, and he's such an incredible human, and, and his family knows. I'd share the song with him um, years back. Um, but uh, do you know this story? Okay, you do. Okay. You're going to make me emotional talking about it right now. I'm sorry, too. Um, ah, man. Look what you've done. <laughs> no, it's okay. This is the beauty of music, though. So, yeah. So that song's about him. And uh, also about someone else in my life who's, who passed away as well over the last few years. But, um, but yeah, it is supposed to be, at the end of the day, a celebration, right? It's supposed to be a memorialization of, like, the beauty of those relationships and remembering those people for who they were, which is a beautiful human being. And they don't know you like I do is about uh, him as well. So, yeah, um, yeah, Wave is one of my favorite on the record. And I'm, and I'm glad it, it spoke to you as well, too. And, um, yeah. Any more questions? Do you guys want to point someone out? <laughs> I th oh man, I don't want the weight of pointing someone okay, out. Okay, no. all right. Uh, the, yeah. the Greek people over there. <laughs> I talked to them before the show. Um, oh, I don't know if I may. Or so you have a question too? Yeah. Okay, all right, all right, okay. <laughs> um, actually, I have a question. It's from Imagine Dragons Brazil and Imagine Dragons Navy. Uh, so it's about the first topic that you were talking about. Um, the songs that you select. Uh, for Act 2 and Act 1. Um, we were interested more on the storyline uh, for the albums. Like, for instance, why is Sharks on Act 2 and not on Act 1? Uh, or Wrecked on Act two, 1 and not on Act 2? Like, how do you select the songs for each album? Like, what's What's connecting each songs? We select songs slowly and painfully, <laughs> yes. is the answer. It was a very long democratic process with lots of voting and lots of different ideas and whittling. I mean, we had like 60 songs that we were working on in that studio that we thought were awesome. And we were like, we have to whittle this down. And it was slow and painful because you fall in love with a song and you, you really want it to, to make it, and then at the end of the day, you, you have trust in everyone that, that you're, you're putting forward the best product and making the best albums that you possibly can. So we ended up with the songs that made up Mercury's Act 1 and 2, and we had a big whiteboard, and we had probably 2,000 different permutations of, of breaking them up, and then we finally landed on this one, and. You know, it, it, it looks like that meme of uh, Charlie Kelly and It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, like, because he can't read the word Pennsylvania. And it's Pepe Silvio, he's got all the things on the wall. But, um, you know, lot, many diagrams, many things erased and rewritten. And, uh, you know, when we, when we landed on this order, it just, it just made sense more than any other one. And we, we all grew up listening to albums from beginning to end, and we're very cognizant of trying to create a narrative and a journey when you listen to the album. So it was actually really cool when we were about to come in here because this is the first time we've been around people who have heard the album. And uh, it's kind of like the Heisenberg effect. Like, y'all observing the album will change how I observe the album. And um, it, it's just, it's really fun. It's a really fun time right now. And there were some lines that made it, we, we, like, to your question of thematically, there were some lines we had set up quite early that we knew uh, that made things a little easier, just in timeline. Mercury Act One really is focused on the immediacy of death. How does what does that sound like? What does that feel like? And uh, Mercury Act Two is is really focused on the the process that comes after. So it's like the coping or waking up, and life has to continue on, right? If you've lost someone that you love, it's life continues. What does that look like? How do what does that feel like? So Mercury Act 1 and 2 are, it's really the, I mean, I, I hate to say that Mercury is about an album about death, because that sounds so morbid, um, but it would be lying to say it, it wasn't primarily focused on loss, grief, life, like something like that. And I think throwing life in there is important because, that, you know, there is a lot of 
joy to this record. It's about being present. It's about, especially Mercury Act 2, like, so what now, right? Are, are you going to, so you lost someone you love, is that going to make you, what would that person want? Well, they would want you then to tomorrow be better for it, to, to you know, to live to your fullest, to wake up every day and, and give a little more and be a little more kind and love more. And that's how you truly can memorialize someone, I think, right? Sadness is obviously going to be there, but if you just are sad every day, I don't think that's what the, any person who loves you would have wanted who passed, right? So yeah, though, we had those lines, and then, and then like Platt said, it was like, okay, now how, <laughs> what's the best way to tell that? What's the order? That te- like, oh my gosh, order is so... That's horrible. It's really a horrible. Brings out the worst in us. Yeah, I think there were. I think there were some things already printed before we changed our mind. We're like, wait, <laughs> yeah, oh stop yeah. the printing. The poor label. We, yeah. we over and over would be like, stop. <laughs> Six and seven need to be tra- reversed. They'd be like, really, guys. And all these machines are whirring in the background, just like, <laughs> stopping the machines, reprinting. So sorry about that. That that seriously happened many times after we had given the complete, our manager is probably in here laughing to himself or is crying to himself <laughs> because yes, we would, yes, arduous. Do we have more time for questions? Where is the mic? Oh, over there. Um, just next to the guy with the um, wild hair, let's put it that way. They're from excellent Greece. They came hair. all the way, with excellent. The excellent hair. They came all the way from Greece. <laughs> Hi guys, um, thank you so much for sharing your music with us both yesterday and today. Sorry to stay on the heavy questions, um, but about your music and your li- re- lyrics are so personal. And how does that feel sharing um, all that with people? Is it therapeutic? Is it hard for you? Are you looking forward to, to like sing about it or are you um, kind of afraid every time? I think a, a little bit of all, right? I would, I, I would be lying, I think, if I said only excited or only nervous. It's, it's a little bit of, uh, you know, vulnerability is a tricky thing um, because, and you learn this early on as a child, and it's why people shut down because sometimes you'll be vulnerable and it's not received or somebody will throw it back in your face. And when that happens, it's very easy to just be like, well, I'm never being vulnerable ever again with anybody. Um, But then sometimes you'll meet individuals that hear it and return it, and it means something to them. Um, And and that's part of life. And and that's a beautiful thing because it... It's the tightrope of vulnerability. Uh, And I don't know if I'll ever arrive at a place where I just confidently walk into every room. I I don't know. I think that would be a sad existence. So, vulnerable, yes. Uh, excited, yes. Nervous, yes. Um, and I think when that stops, then we'll probably stop being a band, probably. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, over there. Just pass it on, the girl next to you. <laughs> Hello. Um, first of all, crazy show yesterday and it's really insane to watch you go from playing 200 people in a small club like a few years back and now playing a whole stadium. Um, My question is more tour related. How do you decide with so many albums you have put out um, which songs make it on the set list? Because yesterday I noticed there were not many songs from Mercury on there and a lot of Smoke and Mirrors or Night Visions. So who decides, how do you do it? Do you take opinions from fans on Twitter or do you really just do your own thing and take your favorite songs or how does it work? Oh man, that's a hard one too. <laughs> well, certainly, I, I can tell you first and foremost, we decide. There's no, I wish, you know, it'd maybe be nice to have some Lord manager that's like, you must play these 20 songs. We'd be like, all right, this is easy. <laughs> like just being a puppet on a string. It's like, mm, okay. Um, no, so we decide it's really hard because we have typically two hours to to put on this show. Vocally, it's very taxing uh, for me when I'm on tour. I am a baritone singing tenor, typically. So I'm always singing a touch out of my range (laughs) because I I just like to write out of my range, I guess, and like suffering is something I love. (laughs) Um, So two hours we found is like, that's my limit where I can have a healthy vocal cord. and 
and uh, like you want to play the songs that everybody wants to hear. Of course, we want to play. You know, but you also want to be kind of selfish and play the songs you want to play. So it's this this da tricky dance that I don't think a musician can ever figure out. Which is like, because if we were to just play Mercury, for instance, which we would love self. If it was selfishly, we would always just play our newest music. Right. Yeah, every artist is always when someone asks us, "What's your favorite song to play?" It's like, "Well, our newest." Right? Because you haven't played it a thousand times or twenty thousand times. Um, but then I feel like that is unrewarding to us too, because there's something beautiful about playing these old songs, and it, it, it's sometimes if you feel a lot of pain because you you know you don't want to revisit that feeling or the naivety that you had when you wrote that song. So, at the end of the day, long story short. We change it up quite a bit. We're going to be changing it again here really soon. We just changed it a second ago. Um, it's we, we really try to play the songs that the fans want to hear. So we do. We are listening, um, but uh, there's so many there's so many records and so many songs now. It's really hard. I don't. Can someone else give a better answer? I don't have a great answer to this. Oh, we're taking requ we'll take requests. Yeah, go ahead. Shout them out. <laughs> no, it, it's a problem that only multiplies with every record too. So we're gonna we're about to have another 18 songs that are gonna be fighting for a spot. So the battle continues. Sometimes it's easy. Like we'll play Cutthroat one night, and I'll be like, okay, now my vocal cords are ruined for the whole tour. So <laughs> yeah, it's easy. <laughs> sharks. We have a request for sharks. Good. Sharks. sharks. Yeah, good. Even made a sign. That's dedication. All right, let's go all the way to the back. The guy in the blue shirt has been waving all this time. So, um, yeah, let's give him the mic. First of all, thank you and your brother Mac for putting on such an amazing performance night after night. Uh, last night was amazing. I have a very serious question, actually, for Dan. Um, what was it like surfing in the Bellagio Lagoon? <laughs> It was honestly horrifying. And I'll tell you why. There were tons of people out. I had, I've surfed. I have uh, you know, surfed in the ocean. I've surfed like wakeboarding. I've done surfing off the back of a boat. So the, when they told us, OK, you're going to surf in the Bellagio Fountains, it's going to be an electric surfboard. I thought, OK, this will be they, they said, well, let's get a body, a, you know, a double to do it. And I was like, no, 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 I do my own stunts. <laughs> I've been punched in the face by Dolph Lundgren. Like, I, will do, I can do this. But I had no idea what that actually looked like. So, and then I had to learn it in the fountain with a bunch of people walking down the Las Vegas Strip looking in and being like, is that the Imagine Dragons guy? And he's like, <laughs> is he in a suit? And he's about to surf? Okay, let's, you know, like. And uh, it was really hard. And I, at first, I could not do it. I failed. I, I can't believe there's not like a YouTube compilation that didn't come out of it of like, look how horrible Dan Reynolds is at surfing. Uh, especially when the fountains go off, the water gets like super choppy. And you feel like you're going to die. It's like fireworks, like poof. Like those fountains, if I would have been over one of those, it would have shot me up in the air for sure. But um, after like an hour and a half, of me reassuring everybody, like, no, I'm gonna get this. You have like, you're like holding like a, a, a throttle thing that like is very sensitive. So, and you're trying to get up. So on a surfboard, you know, you, you just can get up, but I'm holding this thing. So you're trying to get up and then you're like, and it like shoots up. It was just, it was horrible to be honest. But uh, I finally, after an hour and a half, it's very sunburnt and angry and I had a rash like all down my whole chest because I was just so competitive. I was like, there was a body double waiting. He was literally just watching me like, I don't think you're going to get it. Like, you know what I mean? I was like, well, you're going to have to cut your hair because he had long hair. But uh, so that helped. It, it, the competitiveness in me was like, I will learn this. It was really hard. I'd be lying if I told you otherwise. Amazing. Let's go even further back. Like last row over there, the girl with the two hands up maybe. Yes. <laughs> so first, if I have a chance to speak to you, I just wanted to say that your song Demons, uh, 10 years ago, ha really helps with my uh, anorexia, and it was really a lifesaver. 
And my question to you is, uh, in your albums, if you, uh, from previous thoughts, uh, put the similar number of more happy and more sad songs? Well, first of all, you're incredibly brave uh, for being so vulnerable, so love you for that. And, um, and just to fully understand it was what's like the, the dial between happy songs and sad songs and how do we choose how much happy versus sad. It's really just a product of life, right? It's like if, if the three years while we're writing a record is happy, then it's a happy record, which that's never happened <laughs> for us. But like if it's a really sad time like Smoke and Mirrors, then it's a really sad, sad record. Um, it's it's just it's you know what it is it's it's simply if if I were to take someone's journal and I said okay here's your journal for the last two years and I'm your editor and I get to go through it and I'd be like well this was seventy percent happy and thirty percent sad or something and so now we need to whittle this down to ten pages so I'm gonna take one page I'm gonna take seven pages of happy and three pages of sad I'm good at math ten yeah. percent thank you I'm glad I chose ten percent like an easy percent right. But um, that's really what it is. We'll, all four of us will sit and, and look at these 300 songs. And every time, you know, the guys will write something and send it to me, and then I'll write lyrics to it, or I'll write something, and I'll send it to the guys. It, I always send it to the guys. And everybody gives their opinion the day that they hear it. And then we listen to it throughout those two years, and a lot changes, right? Some songs that you thought were great or may have moved you on day one, you hate after two, three years. It's, it's the good part about probably taking a while to write a record is you find the songs that live well with you. And those are the ones we release. And so sometimes someone might listen to this song and be like, I really don't like this song. And so we just say, we'll give it two years. <laughs> um, but yeah, hopefully that answers your question. I would say we, we even go deeper and more painfully and more, even slower with ratios. It, 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 it's not just happy, sad. I think at one point we had broken this up into extroverted and introverted. Yeah, yeah. And like, uh, yeah. Me, uh, yeah. <laughs> indifferent. Okay, here's indifferent songs. Angry, want to kill someone. You know, like, hungry. Of, hungry. Hungry. Yeah. Angry. Yes. Dan was hungry that day. Okay, those will probably never see. All the, the lyrics language. are about delicious food. <laughs> Great. Let's get over to this side because I haven't. I don't think we've been on this side. And maybe the girl with the dark lipstick, <laughs> the black lipstick. You have great vision, by the way. I put on my contact lenses impressed. just for you guys. Um, thank you guys. Um, first of all, thanks so much for whoever organized this, whoever I, whoever's idea this was. Nothing cool like this ever I happened here. <laughs> here, here. It was not our manager's idea, it was our idea. <laughs> Yay! That's the truth. Thank you, yeah. thank you. I saw, I saw Ben cringe a little. I saw Ben cringe a little when someone in the back was like, good job, Mac and the guys, for traveling the world and making this right. I don't know what you're talking about. It's like, the manager is not on the road, putting in the time. Sorry, this is band jokes. Sorry, go ahead. I'm so sorry. Yes, band jokes. jokes. <laughs> Better for backstage, maybe, with just us. Yeah, okay. Next time. Thank you guys so much for the amazing concert yesterday. Um, I didn't go to your show in 2018 because I was so depressed that I couldn't leave my house. So it was amazing to be back and seeing you guys on stage again. So thanks so much. Um, my question is actually really short and more of an understanding question about the new record. Um, I really loved um, Sirens, the song. And I was just wondering, the sirens refer to sirens that are an alarm going off in your head? Or is sirens referring to sirens who are sort of luring you in like from mythology? I wish it was those sirens sound much more uh, enticing. No, uh, not those, not the good sirens. More like sirens that are like, you know. Wee -oo, wee -oo. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that was a sh short question and short answer. That's it. Uh, yeah, let's go. The, the girl with the striped shirt. Okay, can I ask a question? Oh, yeah, of course, you're next to her. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm very nervous. Um, th uh, first of all, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> oh, don't be nervous. We love you. Take your time. We're nervous. We're nervous too. <laughs> I 
Um, first of all, thank you for giving us the opportunity to listen to your beautiful new songs first before everyone else. Um, <laughs> And um, before we came in here, like, um, oh, sorry. It's fine, take your I'm time. I'm so sorry. Your You're totally I'm so bad good. at this. <laughs> um, so uh, how is it for you to play or write like very sad songs like Demons or um, now on the new record, uh, I Don't Like Myself, um, which I can <laughs> very much relate to. Um, how is it? We like you. We <laughs> like you. Oh. <laughs> can I come give you a hug? <laughs> can I give you a hug? My question was, um, um, when we were queuing to came inside here, we were asked um, from you uh, why um, we love you so much. And like everyone in the queue said that we can relate to your music. And uh, how does that make you feel that so many people can relate to your music? It's a great question. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things that is in It's so hard to understand for us. Like 10 years in, I still will turn to the guys. We'll, we'll go, you know, we were just in Prague and it was like two nights in an airport hangar of like 60,000 people a night. And still it boggles our mind. It is something I don't know that I'll ever comprehend, but it's so beautiful, cathartic, refreshing, you know, it's especially during the, the lockdown, when you kind of dig in and into a hole, it's really easy for me to be a huge recluse because I love it. <laughs> I love to be alone, uh, you know, and, and but it's the worst thing for me because then I actually become too reclusive and then I become unhappy because I'm at, you know, we are as humans, we're social beings. We, we need each other, right? We, we, we want to connect with each other. Um, but sometimes it's hard to do that, right? It's hard to, to connect. And so I, I feel like we're really incredibly lucky because we get to get on a stage every night and see the best part of humanity. We get to see what music, the reason that everybody loves music is, is, is because it brings people together. It makes us feel united uh, under a, a, a cause, right? Like these songs that, you know, we, we feel united. And the world can feel incredibly divided when you're just sitting at home looking at the internet or surfing the news or whatever it is. It become, can become very intimidating very quickly where you just feel like everyone's out to get you. Everyone hates each other. Everybody's so different. And music is this great uniting force where we get to see that we are the same. Right, like I want to hug you because it's like hugging myself. I feel like I see you and I see so much of myself in you. And I'm like, man, I've, I've, I've felt that. And let me give you a hug so we can connect and be like, man, our consciousness is aligned and we're, we're just the same, you know? And that's the beauty of music is it really, um, it, it, it's the great uniter in that way. So great question. The girl with the striped shirt, the black and white striped shirt, just behind her. Yes. Hi. Uh, thank you for mentioning Prague because I was there and it was amazing. So thank you for that show. Um, I was just wondering, what is the story behind sharks? As I was thinking about that since the midnight. <laughs> so I was just wondering, what is the story? Thank you. Thank you. Um, man, I'm talking so much. I'm sorry. It comes with being the lyricist or 
Uh, yes. So I'm just going to I'm going to continue on. Uh, Sharks is kind of a tongue-in-cheek look, self-reflection at hypocrisy. It's like, uh, you know, looking out at the world and being like, man, everyone's out to get you and everyone's a shark and look at all the sharks in the water and then being like, wait, <laughs> sometimes I can be a shark and sometimes, you know, it's that reflection of like, we all have our imperfections. We all have our weaknesses and if we don't constantly remind ourselves of that, then we become less and less uh, loving as humans. Like we become less patient with each other, right? Like it's, I think being like constantly reminding yourself and checking yourself is a huge important part of life. It's one of the great reasons that my brother is my manager because <laughs> he's always checking me. And I think it's good to be checked as humans. And Sharks is about kind of checking yourself. It's about, you know, looking out and being like, maybe stop judging the sharks because... You've been a shark, and you're being a shark right now by even judging the sharks. <laughs> so it's like a meta kind of weird shark song. <laughs> yeah, there it is in a sentence. Meta weird shark It's about song. shark vision. Shark, shark vision. vision. <laughs> there it is. I should have just said that. I mean, oh. Your, yours was better. We have one more question, and let, let's get the guy over there. Uh, just, yeah, over there. Yes, sorry, last one. Thank you very much. Thank you for a great show yesterday. Thank you, Platzman, for the drumstick. It was amazing. Thank you. Good catch. Oh, <laughs> Thank I, you. I recognize you now. You are my side, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right side. There's no sides. There's no sides. There is. There is. <laughs> you're, you're middle side. You don't know the sides. Either there's you're big, with Ben or you're with me. There's big rivalry. Yeah. yeah. Is that a thing? Is it like you're Absolutely. either... Absolutely. No, it's not. <laughs> Is it everything where you're like, my side's better than Ben's side or something? Like no, that? never that his side is better. <laughs> oh, yeah, gotcha. Are we going to take that, my side? Come on. No. <laughs> fight, fight. I recognize some of those people from my side. <laughs> anyway, what was your, you had a question. What was it? Whose side is better or something? <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's actually about riddles. You guys ha do so much, so many riddles. The um, guitar uh, hidden in the desert, uh, the new release of songs, the names, um, and other events. Uh, who comes up with the riddles? Who, like uh, the beautiful uh, graphics from Tim Cantor on the Smoke and Mirrors albums, the hidden things uh, hidden in the album cover? Whose ideas are these clues? Because it's uh, such a community binding experience to find the answer, and there are like Discord channels dedicated for that <laughs> sole reason. We we all are quite nerdy characters, if you can't tell. <laughs> um, it, so it goes back to our very first EP. Uh, I remember when we were putting out our first EP that we made. So this was was it self titled? I think I think it was yep. self titled Imagine Dragons. You can find it if you Google on the internet. And it was a magic eye, <laughs> you, you know, it was like in the moment where magic eyes were cool or something. You know, you like touch your nose to it and you slowly back it off and then you see like something come out. So we It worked like, at one point. Yeah. I think along the way it got a little... I think if we, you find it on Google, it won't work anymore. Yeah, the reprints, <laughs> don't, they didn't get the color right. I think yeah. it still maybe works. I, I, yeah? Really? Okay. I don't I know. Maybe, maybe not. It if do it doesn't it. work, it's definitely you. Yeah, yeah. I do it the wrong way where I just go cross-eyed and then it goes inward. Have but you ever seen it? Like, yeah, yeah. But it goes inward for me. You know, it's supposed yeah, yeah, to come yeah. out because I do it the reverse way. Does I go anybody know what I'm talking about? Has anyone actually seen? Yeah, they know a magic eye, you know, those like blurry, weird looking things. But you've the, seen it in that. And the coins pop out of the page. Up. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Okay. It's a schooner. Anyway, so it, long story short, and it was a dragon. <laughs> you imagine a dragon. <laughs> uh, Get it? <laughs> and then our second EP, we like, we did it. So you, we like, this is so cheesy, but we like sent out, what were those red and blue? Yeah, 3D, yeah. Glasses. 3D glasses. We were like, a, this will be such a selling point. People will love to buy these. We'll give you 3D glasses. And then you put them on and like the here, it was Hear Me was yeah. the name of that EP. And it had Hear Me on it. And this is all before we got signed, obviously, and nobody was telling us it was a terrible idea. But um, you would put on these 3D glasses, and then it like popped out a little bit. It was really bad. Like five percent. Yeah, we got it on like we got a free membership online somewhere to like make something 3D. I don't know. But anyway, so we've done it from the very beginning, many years ago. We all love, we love the interaction of like 
riddle me this. You know what I mean? It's it's fun. We've like hid treasure chests in the in the middle of the desert, and fans have flown from all over the world and tried to like. It's joyous to us. We feel we we enjoy the process of feeling part of a community and we and I can't tell you how many times we've made like our own discord and snuck in to the discord channels and and had to help you guys sometimes <laughs> like <laughs> I think this is wrong <laughs> I have a s small idea don't look at me over here <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about it's insane <laughs> we have done this and then like maybe if you scramble the words this way and everybody's like wait that just solved it it's like who figured that out well, I see and we'll be like it was that guy sure <laughs> yeah. so we've certainly been creeping on the, on those channels for years well, we're but, not gonna do, we won't do it again that was oh, just never again time. if anybody ever gives a hint it's certainly not us just <laughs> absolutely not us all right in Europe also <laughs> as well. deal okay <laughs> we'll work on that Thank you. All right, I think that's all the time we have, unfortunately. Thank you so much for your great questions, for sharing your stories and being so vulnerable and open. Thank you. And thank you for everyone watching online as well. Thank you for joining us. And thank you to you guys, Imagine Dragons, for being here with us, connecting with us, and telling your story, and for the amazing new record. Thank you so much for being here thank with you us. Thank you guys, thank you. <laughs>